I'm Emily Kate, and this is We the Voters. Hi, and welcome to the first episode of season one of the We the Voters podcast. I'm your host, Emily Kate, and I'm so excited to have you here with us this season. Uh, A little bit about my background. I'm a multimedia journalist by training, so that means I'm a writer, a producer, a filmmaker, a podcaster, an editor, a social media manager. Basically, I wear a lot of hats, all trying to make my idea, We the Voters, kind of hit the ground and keep running. So We the Voters is a project that I started in July 2019. Essentially, my goal is to travel across all 50 states talking to people in small towns and large cities about their hopes and their dreams, their political beliefs and their values to understand the many ways that we are more alike than we are different. I absolutely love what I do and I'm so excited to bring you season one of the We the Voters podcast, which is all about debunking U.S. myths. While I was on the road, I would go into bars and restaurants and diners or small businesses and talk to people, political organizations and all of these things. And I would talk to people and I would pitch myself and I'd say, I'm doing a project because I believe most people are good. And every single one of those people I talked to said, yeah, I agree with that. That's something I can get behind. So when I talked to hundreds of people and they can say that from all backgrounds, from all walks of life, all across 26 of the 50 states that I've made it to so far. How come we don't see that reflected in our national politics? Where is the disconnect? What are we losing? That's what we're going to talk about today. Today's topic is political polarization. So I think where we need to begin is what is polarization? Like really? Well, polarization, it's more than just disagreeing with your neighbor or someone in your family. And it's not the same as disagreeing on policy, which is part of the push and pull of a democracy. Instead, polarization happens when you go just a step further. The Facebook posts that say, if you disagree with blah, 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 unfriend me now. It's reading news from only sources that publish what you agree with. And yeah, it's even our leaders in Congress or other levels of government who refuse to even meet or compromise with the other side. Political polarization happens when attitudes about policy and government diverge into ideological extremes. In a two-party system like the United States, this polarization illustrates the tension we have between binary ideologies and identities. Basically, it urges people to pick a side. And since humans like to belong in groups, we often do. Tribalism is essentially a fancy name to describe the way we organize ourselves into groups and how attitudes from belonging to these groups can impact the culture at large. This happens in small ways like how we make friends or how we identify ourselves in conversations. But yeah, like most things, it does come back to politics. In the past decade, political polarization and tribalism have become hot button topics. They dominate cable news shows, they spawn hundreds of op-eds in newspapers and magazines across the country, and they're lamented in both digital and real life spaces. And yet, it often feels like there's no movement towards the middle. Even when the thing we all seem to agree on the most is how divided we actually are. So, watching the news, it's easy to feel like we've never been more divided than we are today. But is that feeling founded in reality, or is it just a feeling? Well, history says that we have been more divided in the past, or at least just as divided as we are today. The political climate in the 1850s was extraordinarily polarized, particularly by regional identities. A researcher at the North Carolina State University pointed out that the Compromise of 1850, a move that acquired additional territory after the Mexican-American War, deepened the growing division between the North and the South. In this compromise, California was annexed to a free state, New Mexico and Utah were granted popular sovereignty, slave trade was abolished in D.C., and a fugitive slave law was passed. Just a decade later, after the tensions grew to a tipping point, the Civil War began. But historians are hesitant to draw this direct parallel between the 1850s and today. While there is a deepening us versus them narrative, there is not a clear regional split as there was during the Civil War with the Northern and the Southern factions. In fact, there are Democrats and Republicans in each of all of the 50 states. 
So while there is this deep resentment and anger on both sides of the aisle, much like the decade before the Civil War, it seems as though the attitude to do something about it is different. In the late 1850s, historians say that armed conflict was embraced on both sides as inevitable. One historian, Dr. Jason Phillips from West Virginia University, notes that people rushed towards combat, both physically and metaphorically. Today, on the other hand, it seems like we are more slow to move towards extreme action, instead leaning on verbal altercations and protests and via social media platforms. In a 2018 interview with the Christian Science Monitor, Dr. Phillips said that we don't have the same view they had, that war was something that we could control. Nowadays, he says, you can start wars, but they're not easy to stop. Wars don't end problems. So, in the 1850s, division ripped through national political parties, and it ripped the country apart. In 1858, two congressmen got into a fistfight during a nighttime debate regarding slavery in Kansas. It grew immediately beyond the two men as colleagues from both sides of the aisle raced into the scuffle, returning blow for blow. Some historians have pointed to this moment as foreshadowing for the Civil War to come. But, contrary to what one may think, the Gilded Age, a period of time after the Civil War until the turn of the 20th century, is largely considered to be one of the most polarized times in American history. This time included open political violence, highly polarized discourse, and the election of 1896, which is notable as some scholars say it led to an era of quote, one party rule, unquote, which created this opportunity for elected officials to build careers as politicians. It also increased party homogeneity and fueled distress for that quote, other side. So, during the Gilded Age, further lines were being drawn regionally by both political parties. The Republican Party was strengthening a hold on industrial areas, while the Democratic Party lost ground in parts of the North and the Midwest. But another phase of high polarization came 60 years later during the 1960s, a time that is nearly synonymous with the word, as the country grappled with the ugly realities of systemic racism, discrimination, and war. Historians Maurice Isserman and Michael Kazin wrote in their book America Divided, The Civil War of the 1960s, that the left blazed through the 60s like a meteor, reshaping the cultural landscape, particularly in the areas of gender and race. They add that during this time, the right had established itself as an equally unified political movement, cementing its goals of preserving social and moral order, promoting traditional values, and encouraging self-reliance and a tough stand against communism. Drawing these metaphorical lines in the sand created a duality in American life, two different realities that still inform much of our culture today. A recent period of high polarization came in the 1990s, including a notable speech from former White House Communication Director Pat Buchanan during the 1992 Republican National Convention. In this speech, he declared a culture war for the future of the country, a war of words and attitudes that have continued to grow over the years that followed. Which brings us to today. Actually, hold on. There's one last thing I want to talk about before we make it to today. The infamous party switch myth. In the 1860s, Republicans, who had dominated the northern states, expanded federal power. This move helped fund the Transcontinental Railroad, the state university system, and the settlement of the West. Democrats, who dominated the South, opposed those measures. After the Civil War, Republicans passed laws that protected Black Americans and advanced social justice causes. Once again, the Democrats largely opposed these measures, citing the expansion of federal power as the reason why. Still with me? So in 1936, Democratic President Franklin Roosevelt won re-election, largely based on the strength of the New Deal, a set of reforms that regulated the banks, founded welfare and pension programs, and developed infrastructure. He won in a landslide against his Republican opponent, who opposed this expansion of federal power. So what happened? Sometime between the 1860s and the 1930s, the party of small government became the party of big government, and vice versa. At the turn of the century, historians note that an influential Democrat businessman blurred the party lines by supporting the government's role in social justice reform by expanding federal power. Mind you, at this time, this was a pretty traditional Republican stance. Eric Rauchway, a history professor at the UC Davis, once wrote that for a couple of decades, both parties are promising an augmented federal government devoted in various ways to the cause of social justice. 
Gradually, however, he says, the Republican rhetoric drifted towards counter-arguments with a small government platform solidifying in the 1930s alongside its opposition to the New Deal. During this time period, both parties were trying to, quote, win the West. New states were created during the Civil War era, and they made up a new voting bloc, and politicians on both sides of the aisle wanted its attention. So, Democrats began promoting support for the, quote, little guy, promising federal support that had previously gone to the business sector. From this point on, they stuck with the stance of favoring federally funded social programs and benefits, while Republicans moved to a counter position of small, more hands-off government. But did the Democratic Party found the Ku Klux Klan? This talking point has circulated wildly through the past few years, as conservative scholars point to its growth in the wake of the Civil War in largely Democratic Southern states. The short answer is this claim is misleading. The long answer is this. The KKK was founded in 1866 by ex-Confederate soldiers. It began as a social club, but quickly became a violent white supremacist group. It attracted many ex-Confederate soldiers and Southerners who opposed Reconstruction. And yes, most of them were Democrats. After all, Nathan Bedford Forrest, who was an ex-Confederate general and a prominent slave trader, he even spoke at the 1868 Democratic National Convention. When the Jim Crow laws set in in the 1870s, the KKK became mostly obsolete, although it was restarted in 1915. The second era of the Klan was made up of both Republicans and Democrats, although Democrats were more widely involved. But the KKK was not founded by the Democratic Party of today, even if many of the members of the Klan were Democrats then. Experts have found that while factions of the Democratic Party were responsible for the South's secession and the rise of the KKK, it's inaccurate to claim that the Democratic Party of today is responsible for either. It would be the same as claiming that the Republican Party of today is responsible for the Proud Boys or the Boogaloo Boys. While some members of these groups may be Republicans, the Republican Party is not directly responsible for their formation. So, looking back, it is indisputable that the Democratic Party was deeply involved in its support of racism and white supremacy in and around the Civil War. But, through the 20th century, the Democratic Party evolved to become the party we know today. At the start of the 20th century, the Republican Party was much more concerned with protecting black citizens and their voting rights than its Democratic counterparts. But in the middle of the 20th century, both parties saw their stances on racial equality begin to switch. Joe Grinspan, a curator at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, said the following in an interview. It started with FDR and the New Deal, but the actions of Lyndon B. Johnson in the 1960s with the Voting Rights Act and civil rights legislation really kind of sealed the deal, unquote. During the mid-20th century, the Democratic Party switched policy ideals and began introducing large government policies that supported voting rights and other social justice issues. With this realignment, many former Democratic voters opposed these large government policies and left the party to cross the aisle. This move largely cemented in the coming decades, bringing a distinct break in political ideology. Voters who believe that large government is the way to solve inequity and other societal problems, and voters who believe that these solutions are better handled among the people, with small government or left up to the states. What history teaches us is that neither political party is set in stone. Politicians may switch parties if their views no longer ally with the party they first went with, and voters are the same. But also, policy changes can push parties into different ideological directions, which, once again, brings us to today. So, where do we stand today? According to a 2017 study by the Pew Research Center, 80% of Americans feel unfavorable towards their partisan adversaries, and the portion that feels very unfavorable has nearly tripled since 1994. These unfavorable attitudes, which come from both sides of the aisle, have only appeared to strengthen in the highly charged political climate. Recent psychology research has found that Americans are willing to accept smaller paychecks to avoid listening to opposing opinions, move to new places that match their ideologies, and dismiss potential romantic partners when they disagree with them politically. Another study found that Americans are more willing to exclude people with opposing political beliefs than they are to exclude people from different races, which, if you've spent any time on Facebook in the past five years, you may find unsurprising, as the number of people who write statuses like, if you voted for X candidate, unfriend yourself now, have grown. 
This attitude of tribalism, of surrounding yourself with people who think like you, is not new, nor is it limited to politics. But it feels more fervent now than ever before, or even than it was five or ten years ago. Researchers have found that Americans on both sides of the aisle tend to overlook the faults of policies they support, and overlook the merits of opposing policies. They tend to double down on their own feelings and beliefs. Also, there is a growing number of people who only seek information that reaffirm their political beliefs. They disregard facts that counter them and prioritize loyalty to their side over civil discourse. Out of loyalty, one researcher wrote, Americans treat core party issues as immune to debate and suppress their opponents' views. Now we see this in the halls of our government, as well as in conversations on social media and in the halls of, quote, real life. So, when neither side appears willing to give any ground, how do we proceed to a place in the middle or at least a new destination? Are we destined to remain this partisan forever? There are two sides of opinion on this. A, that we're polarized past the point of compromise, or B, that we are not as polarized as it may seem, or that there's still time to heal. So let's take a break, and then I'll come back and we'll handle side one. We are polarized past the point of compromise. And we're back. All right, so side one of this argument about political polarization is that we are polarized past the point of compromise. And it's easy to point fingers and blame. It's the other person's fault. It's not mine. And this instinct is alive and well within our political system. More often than not, people on both sides of the aisle don't want to give an inch. They like being in power. And if they aren't in power, they're desperately trying to grab some. So neither side is perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Where do we go from here? Right-leaning media, commentators, and politicians are often blamed for completely dismissing the other side or not giving an inch. Take this excerpt from Politicking with Larry King, where conservative talk show host Dennis Prager has this to say about the future of politics. But the truth is there is no president who's going to bring America together. The the left-right divide is unbridgeable. You you can be married to one, you can have them as as brothers and brothers-in-law, and I hope you love each other, and I really do. But the left-right divide is unbridgeable. Whatever the issue... So since compromise has made America great, we've only been forged forward by compromise. What is your proposal to cure this bridge, since it's uncurable? Right. Right. Frankly, uh, both sides understand... Right, I don't have. My cure is to show that conservative principles will make America better and more young Americans will buy those ideas. But all those conservative principles have been taken down. Reagan went against them. George H. W. Bush went against them. George W. Bush went against a lot of those principles. So when have those principles ever been accepted by the American public? Well, Ronald Reagan ran on the idea that the government was the problem, not the solution. And Trickle he was down, elected. failed. Well, that way, that well, it didn't fail. He, he, didn't. he in fact, he, he created a tremendous economy which lasted for about twenty years. Uh, look, if you believe that a big state, let me ask you. Forget I'll ask you. George H. W. Bush and George H. W. Bush was not a conservative. Oh, never was a conservative, and and he would not even call himself a conservative. He would he would say he's mainstream. Okay, fine. Maybe compared to you, he's a conservative. But we conservatives do not, and is not a not knock of he's a very fine man, but he's not a conservative. In rejecting former President George H.W. Bush as a conservative, Dennis Prager brings to light another interesting part of tribalism, the idea of othering members of your own party if they don't agree with the ideology you're promoting now. For instance, 87% of Republicans approve of President Trump's job performance as of an NBC poll released during his final week in office. Among those Republican voters who support Trump over party, the number is as high as 98%, nearly full support. While voters who say they support the GOP over the president, his approval still stands at 81%. These numbers are nearly identical as they were when a survey was taken in October. But tribalism has a strong role for both conservatives and liberals. Belonging to a group or the threat of being ousted from a group can be a powerful method of keeping people in line. See the example of Brian Kemp, the Republican governor from Georgia. 
Governor Kemp's approval rating fell seven points among Georgia Republicans since Election Day, and it fell to 46 percent among voters overall. A December poll found that 19 percent of voters in Georgia disapproved of his job performance, and that nearly doubled since Election Day. This has been associated with several factors, including COVID-19 precautions, but it is largely attributed to comments that former President Trump made about the Georgia governor. On November 13th, former President Trump called out Governor Kemp, questioning the integrity of the state's election. Trump and his allies pushed Kemp and Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger to take actions to overturn President Joe Biden's narrow victory in the state. When Kemp and Raffensperger completed their investigation and found no evidence to overturn the election results, former President Trump continued his harassment of elected officials in Georgia. He made claims that Governor Kemp had colluded with Democrat Stacey Abrams, making it, quote, impossible to check ballot signatures. These claims from President Trump and other Trump loyalists led to a distinct drop in support among Georgia Republicans particularly those who supported President Trump over the GOP. By the end of 2020, it went from Brian Kemp being a lauded member of the GOP and a so-called rising star to fervent hashtag Stop This Deal supporters protesting in front of the governor's mansion. Chants of, quote, Kemp is a traitor and, quote, recall Kemp resounded from what was once a supportive voting bloc. Kemp is just one example of what happens when a person steps out of the comfortable patterns of tribalism in today's political climate, even when backed by facts that don't have a side. It is easier often to otherize people you don't agree with than to explore opinions, facts, or ideology that conflicts with your worldview. But the left is not exempt from this fervent tribalism either. Consider college campuses. Colleges and universities have been under scrutiny from conservatives and moderates for decades now, as these groups say that academia has moved further and further to the left, often to the detriment of students' education. Columnist Nicholas Kristof wrote in a 2016 New York Times column that, quote, We liberals are adept at pointing out the hypocrisies of Trump, but we should also address our own hypocrisy in the terrain we govern, such as most universities. Too often, we embrace diversity of all kinds except ideological, he continues. Quote, we champion tolerance, except for conservatives and evangelical Christians. We want to be inclusive of people who don't look like us, so long as they think like us. Unquote. So, does this lack of ideological diversity do a disservice to students and to liberal ideals themselves? On campuses across the country, protesting speakers, particularly conservative ones, is nothing new. But the impulse to protest these speakers has grown to even protesting people who are now considered too center of the left, but are still on the left. In 2016, Scripps College students protested former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, a Democrat and the first woman to hold that post, because she was a, quote, white feminist, unquote. Obviously, the challenges conservative face on university campuses is not the same as the discrimination people of color or other marginalized group face. That would be an apple to oranges comparison. But this attitude of tribalism only begets more tribalism. When conservatives are protested off campus, it sends a message to other speakers, conservative students, and conservative faculty that their ideas are not welcome here. And in a party that claims to desire diversity, wouldn't that extend to diversity of thought? Christoph writes that, quote, We liberals should have the self-confidence to believe that our values can triumph in a fair contest in the marketplace of ideas. A 2012 study found that a third of social psychologists admitted that when choosing between two equally qualified candidates, they were more likely to pick the one that was less conservative. 59% of anthropologists and 53% of English professors said they would be less likely to hire someone if they were an evangelical Christian. Jonathan Walton, a Harvard professor, said in a New York Times interview that this was unsurprising. He said, quote, Those same arguments I hear people make about evangelicals sound so similar to the ways people often describe folks of color, i.e. politically unsophisticated, lacking education, angry, bitter, emotional, poor, unquote. A 2014 study in the American Journal of Political Science found that 80% of people on either side of the aisle selected a student from their own party to win a scholarship. In the same study, they found that the discrimination against people of the other political party was much greater than discrimination based on race. Nicholas Kristof asserts that this creates a bias that leads to liberal privilege. Even entrance exams have been shown to use reading comprehension questions with liberal slants, setting the stage for liberal students to succeed. Now, 
Some liberals say that conservatives stray away from academia for more lucrative professions. But this doesn't always explain why there are conservative math professors, but not many right-wing anthropologists. Shutting out conservatives is not the answer. Jonathan Haidt, a social psychologist from NYU, says, quote, Universities are unlike other institutions in that they absolutely require that people challenge each other so that the truth can emerge from limited, biased, flawed individuals. He says, quote, If they lose intellectual diversity or they develop norms of safety that trump challenge, they die, unquote. But in a demographic that promotes liberal progressive ideological thought and promotes cancel culture, is there any way for conservatives to make a stand on college campuses? Adam Sutzla, a PhD student from Cornell University, wrote a Boston Globe op-ed that said the following, quote, A college campus should be a place where students, liberal or conservative, refine their ability to listen and respond to people on the other side. Changing minds entails engagement with people who have different perspectives, sometimes one that we might even find abhorrent. To paraphrase the CNN commentator Van Jones, a campus without differing viewpoints is like a weight room that doesn't have any weights, unquote. But let's get off college campuses for a moment. While the right often gets blamed for fueling partisan fire, left-leaning media, commentators, and politicians aren't blameless either. Take this excerpt from Vox, a progressive online news outlet, where one of their staffers broke down the problem of polarization in a video titled, Admit It, Republicans Have Broken Politics. The Republican Party is an insurgent outlier. It has become ideologically extreme, scornful of compromise, and dismissive of the legitimacy of its political opposition. The Democratic Party, while no paragon of civic virtue, is more open to incremental changes, fashioned through bargaining with the Republicans. This asymmetry constitutes a huge obstacle to effective governance. Holy sh**. Our man and I came to the conclusion that we couldn't sugarcoat this anymore. The fact is that Congress changed. Ernstine's critique of the modern GOP falls into two major categories. Their goals and their methods. There's no question that the Republican Party's goals have become more extreme over the past few years. As the video continues, Vax reporter Carlos Maza and his interview subject, political scientist Norm Ornstein, break down a trend called asymmetric polarization. This trend asserts that while both parties have moved away from the center, the Republican Party has moved toward the extreme more quickly, posing a big obstacle in American politics. A study by the Pew Research Center finds that there have been ideological shifts among parties between 1994 and 2014, but it's been more pronounced among conservatives. This can also be seen outside of academia, for example, in the changing rhetoric around issues like immigration. In 2006, former President George W. Bush said that there was a, quote, rational middle ground between granting an automatic path to citizenship and a program of mass deportation, unquote. But just a decade later, President Trump had this to say about the same topic, quote, you are going to have a deportation force, unquote. Researchers at UCLA have spent decades looking at the voting records from all leaders in our national politics. They found that from former President Eisenhower to former President Trump, Republican presidents have become increasingly conservative, while from former President Truman to former President Obama, Democratic presidents have remained just about as liberal as they've always been. So, when one side opposes legislation at every turn, it challenges the other side to do the exact same thing thus creating a culture of gridlock that shows no sign of letting up anytime soon. But Ornstein suggests that Republicans have more, quote, blame in the creation of the system. After former President Obama was elected in 2008, Senator Mitch McConnell came out and said the following, quote, Our top political priority over the next two years is to deny President Obama a second term, unquote. What came next? a series of blocks, filibusters, and other political games that left compromise and bipartisanship by the wayside. And Democrats? They're not blameless by any means. After former President Trump was elected in 2016, Democrats in both the House and the Senate stood up against conservative policies at nearly every turn, including opposing eight of President Trump's cabinet nominations and three Supreme Court nominees. In June 2020, Senate Democrats blocked a Republican police reform bill, arguing that the bill did not go far enough to root out, quote, failures in policing. Republican Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina had this to say before the vote, quote, if you don't think we're right, make it better. Don't walk away. Vote for the motion to proceed so that we have an opportunity to deal with this very real threat to the America that is civil, that is balanced, unquote. But instead, the legislation failed in a 55-45 vote, falling five votes short of the number required to move forward in debate. 
In an interview on Fox Business Channel, commentator Charlie Kirk had this to say after former President Trump's final State of the Union address in 2020. It, it was a beautiful speech, the, most, the best State of the Union in my lifetime, definitely. And it was, it was wonderful for a variety of reasons. First off, he was able to appreciate our country's history, as you so aptly pointed out, while weaving in personal narratives from veterans, from people that are struggling firsthand and have benefited thanks to Donald Trump's decisions of school choice and economic empowerment. And it was an appreciation of heroes and an aspiration to excellence. And I personally was getting rather irritated and frustrated with Democrats that would not applaud such basic agreeable accomplishments of this administration, such as we want to end the war on AIDS. We are going to win the war against cancer. Lowest ever disabled unemployment. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if the Democrats had hatred for Donald Trump that superseded their love of America. It was a brilliant speech. And for the next couple days, you're going to hear candidates, politicians, and media experts say that Donald Trump is trying to divide America. The Democrats boycotted this speech. They booed him during his speech and hissed him throughout his speech. And Nancy Pelosi tore up his speech. Tell me again who's dividing America. I think it's the Democrats. Now, voting along party lines has become nearly a given, an expectation once leaders ascend into office. An infamous example of this would be the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which is otherwise known as Obamacare, where every Republican voted no. But in the past five years, the data has shown an unprecedented level of party unity when voting in Congress. In 2018, 43% of the votes in the House of Representatives came down to the party line, up from just 16% the year before. House Republicans appear much more likely to stick with their party. 77% of conservative lawmakers are more likely to vote along party lines on divisive issues, compared to just 20% the year before. And on the other hand, 52% of House Democrats were likely to vote along party lines, down 9% from 2017. According to the Bipartisan Policy Center, the last notable moment of bipartisanship in Congress came in 2017, when the late Senator John McCain gave the following speech after a divisive health care vote. During President Trump's campaign in 2016, he promised to repeal and replace the ACA. After numerous attempts, the House approved a repeal measure on a purely party-line vote. But in the Senate, Senator McCain and two of his conservative colleagues were the votes that stopped this effort to repeal individual and employer mandates from the ACA. He said, quote, let's trust each other. Let's return to regular order. We've been spinning our wheels on too many important issues because we keep trying to find a way to win without help from across the aisle, unquote. Prior to the current polarized times, Congress had worked together to create common sense bipartisan reforms addressing key problems in U.S. society, including Social Security reform in 1983, establishing the Children's Health Insurance Program in 1997, and a tax deal to aid recession relief in 2010. So, is this era of bipartisanship a distant memory? It often feels like it, especially when watching cable news or months of inaction through the federal government. But what about that other side, the argument that we are not as polarized as it appears? Let's get more on that after the break. All right. And we're back. I'm Emily Kate, your host of We the Voters. And now we're going to start talking about side two, the idea that we are not as polarized as it appears, or at least there is a way to bridge the divide so we can move forward. So let's start by listening to a segment from NPR where host Scott Simon interviewed Lee Drutman, a senior fellow at New America, a nonpartisan group in Washington. So polls show Americans sharply divided on almost every significant issue, gun rights and regulation, abortion rights and regulation, impeachment, Republican, Democratic, what do you got to be optimistic about? Well, we've been here before, and we've had moments in which our politics have seemed stuck and broken, and at each moment we've pushed through. And I see people getting extremely engaged in politics in the last few years. I think the level of interest and, uh, and passion is, is very high. And uh, I think that will lead us to a new era of reform. Well, tell us about some of the uh, history to which you look back. Yeah, well, I think the most similar era is the progressive era in the 1890s. Inequality is, is out of control. Polarization is high. And parties are both corrupt. And progressives came from all over the country. 
and reformed American democratic institutions, and women got the right to vote, uh, concentrated power was brought under control. So I think we will see something similar happen in the 2020s. Lee Dratman goes on to point out that American citizens agree, on both sides of the aisle, that the political system is broken, and that they want politics to work better. The Hidden Tries Report was a 2018 study by More in Common, an international initiative focused on understanding polarization and social division. In this report, this is what they found. They discovered that the people who hold extreme views on both sides of the aisle get the most airtime. After all, controversy sells, right? But when you break down the beliefs of the American public, the Hidden Tribes report says that about two-thirds of citizens fit into what researchers call the, quote, exhausted majority. And I found this really interesting. In this report, they say that the exhausted majority aren't political centrists. They aren't the swing voter that politicians fight for every election cycle. Instead, the exhausted majority is made up of people who instinctively support compromise, and they may be the key to combating polarization. People within this group, about 67% of the population, are tired of the current state of politics. They're also often more flexible in their viewpoints, and they feel unheard in the national conversation. And frankly, how could they not? Politics and press have shaped a culture where outlandish claims get airtime, gain legs, and grow through a news or an election cycle. Conversations of bipartisanship get waylaid by calls from extremists on both sides to never give an inch. But the majority of Americans, researchers say, want compromise. 65% of the exhausted majority and 51% of people who hold extreme views on both sides of the aisle agree that people need to be more willing to listen and to compromise. So does that mean that the tides are turning in the national conversation? Lee Drutman says that, quote, The danger of our zero-sum politics is that we are a closely balanced country, and both sides are trying to get that elusive permanent majority. He makes an argument that the way out of this current hyperpartisanship moment is to expand the number of political parties, so that not every election is this high-stakes battle for who's going to win that majority. The binary setup of U.S. politics has often been talked about as a stumbling block to civil discourse. Drutman writes in a foreign policy article from 2019 that, quote, they reflect a binary party system that has divided the country into two irreconcilable teams, one that sees itself as representing the multicultural values of cosmopolitan cities, and the other that sees itself as representing the Christian values of the traditionalist countryside. Both believe that they are the true America. The many individuals and groups that don't slot neatly into one of these two teams have no other place to go, unquote. A divided two-party system makes effective governing difficult under any system, but it makes it nearly impossible in the U.S., given that the Founding Fathers couldn't have foreseen how divisive it would become. And polarization is a reinforcing cycle. When both parties pull further apart, the electoral stakes grow higher, and the thought of voting across the aisle seems even more impossible. Drutman writes that, quote, because winner-take-all elections offer no reward for winning less than a majority vote share in a given district, Republicans abandoned the urban districts, and Democrats closed up shop in the rural districts. The parties stopped competing for each other's voters and instead swiveled to their most loyal supporters, unquote. He also asserts that the only way to break the stalemate of polarization is to upend the system that reinforces it. In an increasing number of polls, more and more Americans want more political parties. They want more elected officials to choose from. But a viable third party can't seem to emerge. And Drutman writes that, quote, Even if Americans can agree on wanting a third party, few are willing to gamble on an alternative for fear of wasting their vote. Nor can Americans agree on what third party they would want either. The United States would need five or six parties to represent the true ideological diversity in this country, unquote. But it appears that multiple political parties are working in places like Ireland, New Zealand, and Australia, all democracies that host three or more political parties. And with more parties to choose from, voters would have an opportunity to find groups that more fully match with their beliefs and lessen the strict divides between the right and the left. Let's change gear for a second and talk about reaching across the aisle. When people sit down and talk to someone who has opposing political beliefs, it appears that oftentimes they can find more common ground than they originally thought or at least come to respect and understand the other side as living, breathing people. Here's what GOP representative Trey Gowdy from South Carolina had to say about friendships across the aisle. Well, Bill Nettles uh, in that picture was a U.S. attorney under President Obama. He's, he's to the left of Chairman Mao. Politically, uh, we've been friends for 10 years and we'll be friends until we die. Tulsi Gabbard is one of the 
kindest, uh, nicest, most decent people I have ever met. She happens to be a progressive from Hawaii. Uh, we are, you wouldn't put a progressive Hindu from Hawaii with a three-part Calvinist Republican from South Carolina. Uh, but we have been intentional in our desire to have a friendship. And, mm -hmm. and I think part of what plagues our country now is we have a tendency to surround ourselves with people who just ratify what we already believe. I mean, if you want That's to understand true. how President Obama was elected twice, you got to ask somebody who voted for him. Mm -hmm. And the same with Donald Trump. The media cannot fathom how he is president of the United States. Ask someone who voted for him. They will tell you why he is the president of the United States. But if all you do is surround yourself with the philosophy department at Princeton, then, then no, there are no Trump supporters there. So go ask some people in real America who, who felt a, 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 an angst and, and, and uncertainty that led to his election. But if all we do is talk to people that just ratify what we already believe, yeah. um, you make a great, we're headed you make in a, a bad point. direction. So the question is, is he on to something? Could making more friends across the aisle and breaking out of echo chambers of ideological thought be the answer to country unity? A 2020 Pew Research Center study found that three quarters of Americans had either no or just a few friends across the aisle. And the animosity towards the quote other side, it goes both ways. The tension between the parties is rising. A poll from the Public Religion Research Institute found that 80% of Republicans believe that the Democratic Party has been taken over by socialists. Meanwhile, 80% of Democrats believe that the Republican Party has been taken over by racists. Both sides, they tend to view the other as being more extreme than they actually are. But could creating friendships across the aisle be a potential solution to this divide? It's hard to explore this question without sounding naive. But the answer is, possibly yes. Famous across-the-aisle friendships, like the one between the late Senator John McCain and former Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, have been pointed to as examples of people over party. The late Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the late Antonin Scalia are another example, people who oppose each other ideologically, but like each other personally. Perhaps this is a lesson we citizens can learn from today. According to a recent survey, almost half of U.S. citizens say they have unfriended someone on social media over politics. Over and over again, you hear stories of people who have cut someone off because they disagree on ideology. And while the medium is different, the problem is nothing new. A survey in 1994 found that 16% of Democrats and 17% of Republicans had a, quote, very unfavorable view of their political opposition. In 2014, those numbers had more than doubled. 38% of Democrats and 41% of Republicans held very unfavorable views. Even more, a quarter of Democrats and a third of Republicans consider the other side to be a, quote, threat to the nation's well-being, unquote. When people see the other as a threat, that's quite a bridge to build before you can work or be friends across the aisle. So where do you begin? On the Bulwark podcast with Charlie Sykes, former North Dakota Senator Heidi Heitkamp says that the key to bridging polarization is to change the way we approach the opposition, from those running for political office to those in the U.S. who are just talking with or about their fellow citizens. I, I sum it up this way, Charlie. Instead of talking about culture, gods, guns, you know, gays, you know, the stuff we used to talk about, it's about respect. It's about, yes, you can have a different opinion than I have about these things, but do you respect my opinion? And I think that as you look at this, when people are told repeatedly that they're racist, if they're concerned about, um, you know, what what's happening in America, um, it, they're they're told that they're homophobic if they don't um, uh, agree with uh, certain practices. That there there isn't that back and forth that um, they feel like their opinions respected. Um, so what I would what I would say is. Um, the best way for people to feel included is to be included. And, and I'm not saying that you need to retrench or, or you know, change how you feel about it, but I think you need to have the dialogue. And Breaking out of ideological echo chambers, whether they happen digitally or in real life, is not easy. It's tempting to only seek out information you agree with 
and to surround yourself with people who feel the same as you. The problem is, politics in the U.S. are too evenly split for that to ever be a reasonable solution. Whichever side you agree with, it is indisputable that about half the country voted for your opposition, and 70 plus million people are a lot of people to completely disregard. When you read points of view that challenge you, talk with people from a place of empathy and understanding, and seek common ground from even the most fervent opposition, you grow as a person. By moving outside of echo chambers, you may find something new that surprises or even enlightens you. Campus Akavan is the executive director of the USC Center for Political Future. He writes, quote, We certainly need key improvements to our technologies, media, political infrastructure, and educational systems to keep our republic strong. Many amazing organizations are fighting those fights. However, we as individuals represent the greatest part of the solution. The power of millions of people is the biggest lever to undo polarization. It starts with us. Unquote. In conclusion, political polarization is not a new problem facing U.S. society. Nor will the start of a new administration be a light switch for unity. Instead, polarization will likely plague the minds of citizens, leaders, and political scientists for years to come. But what do you think? Is polarization unbridgeable? Do you have nothing in common with someone on the other side? Or do you think we're really not all that different? Is it possible to take the steps we need to come together as a country? Let me know your thoughts on those questions or anything I've talked about in today's episode by shooting me a text or leaving me a voicemail. I've opened up a hotline at 773-658-9492. You can also email me at wethevotersproject at gmail.com. Your stories and perspectives may be used in an upcoming episode of the podcast or in another part of the We The Voters site. If you've stuck with me this far, thank you. And if you like what you've heard, please consider leaving a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts or tell a friend. That is the best way that we the voters can grow and more people can find this show. If you want to stay in touch with me between episodes, I'll be publishing photos and observations from Inauguration Weekend in real time on both my Facebook and Instagram. You can find We the Voters on Facebook at We the Voters Project, and you can also find me on Instagram at We the Voters. Everything I've talked about in this episode is linked in the show notes, which you can find on the blog at wethevotersproject.com. I'll be back here in your feed next Wednesday with a conversation about the First Amendment. But until then, I'm Emily Kate, and this was We the Voters.